Hello, and welcome to the Duke Cardiology Conference. I'm Sunil Rao, Assistant Professor of Medicine here at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled Clinical Evidence for ICDs and CRT ICDs in Patients with Ischemic Cardiomyopathy. And our distinguished guest is Dr. James Albert, Professor of Medicine here at Duke University Medical Center here in Durham, North Carolina. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure, Sunil. So I'm going to talk about a patient that I'm seeing in clinic who's a 57-year-old gentleman who has a history of coronary artery disease, history of left ventricular dysfunction with an injection fraction of about 30% by echocardiography last year. Okay. Uh, had an MI last year, has been doing pretty well. Although recently, he's starting to develop some class 2 to 3 heart failure symptoms uh, despite good medical therapy. And the question that I've been wrestling with is, what are other things that I can do to reduce his risk or potentially improve his survival? Well, that's an excellent question, Sunil, and uh, we, have, uh, we have some great data now uh, about defibrillators and devices in addition to medications, and I assume, uh, assume your patients on the, the usual medical regimen, beta blockers, uh, ACE inhibitors, et cetera? Absolutely. He's on an ACE inhibitor. He's on a diuretic. He's even on spironolactone uh, as, uh, as well as a beta blocker, and we've been titrating those medicines up and down as his blood pressure tolerates. Uh, and he's been doing reasonably well, reasonably well. But like I said, class two to three heart failure symptoms right now, and his family is very curious. I mean, what is his prognosis? What is it that, uh, you know, potentially he can get into trouble with? And, and what are things that we can do to intervene on that? Well, there's certainly a lot of these patients uh, out there, congestive heart failure is just becoming uh, so common. So uh, let's, let's talk about what we could do, uh, especially in terms of arrhythmias, what's his risk of sudden death, and, uh, and uh, is a device in his future, or possibly? So, so sudden death, uh, as you know, is an extremely common problem. Um, some estimates have it at um, as high as 450,000 events per year. Um, this data is, uh, is a little difficult to get at, and there are some other estimates but uh, it's certainly in a couple to several hundred thousand uh, range per year. And you can see if you compare it with other very serious, very common, very deadly conditions over on the left side of the screen, stroke, lung cancer, breast cancer, AIDS, that, that also get a lot of press, maybe even more, um, sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death uh, may match all of them combined. Now, there's several... Um, ways that, uh, that a cardiac arrest could occur in, in your patient, for instance, Sunil. So it could occur acutely in the course of one of his coronary events if a plaque ruptures or if a plaque uh, leads to thrombosis and occludes the coronary artery. There are certain mechanisms for these ventricular arrhythmias with ischemia and in the acute stages of infarction. But we're really talking uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen where uh, we have a, a stable scar, a, a, uh, uh, an infarct in the myocardium. We have some border zone where there are some surviving fibers that may present the substrate for a reentrant arrhythmia. And then as the heart dilates, either with ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, there are certain arrhythmia mechanisms that may be at work in that setting. Just as a framework to, to think about how these things could occur, as you know, Sunil, the, um, the survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is, uh, is very disappointing. Uh, we had some data from, uh, from the Rochester community that was published a couple years ago in the journal Resuscitation found that only a 7% survival at 30 days with uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And as you can see, the, um, the survival from, a, from an episode of VT or VF that causes cardiac arrest really depends on, upon how quickly you intervene. And uh, the usual response time in most communities is maybe nine, 10 minutes, so uh, the survival is not good in that setting. If on the other hand, you can get to someone earlier with an AED or certainly with an implantable device, then you can save some, most, or, or almost all of these patients. So that brings us to the incidence of why we would use an ICD, as we said, there's a low survival rate of this condition in the community. Um, antiarrhythmic drugs have been tried uh, and failed. They've either increased mortality or not reduced it, depending upon the drug that's been used. AEDs are a great advance, but, uh, but it's hard to get them everywhere that, that an arrest might occur. So that's one problem with that. 
So the implantable defibrillator was developed by um, Michelle Murawski and Morty Maurer. You can see their picture in the top left when they're working at, uh, at one of the Hopkins affiliates in Baltimore. It developed some prototypes they implanted in dogs and showed that it, when they induced ventricular fibrillation, the implanted device could rescue the dog and bring him back to, uh, to normal rhythm and back to wagging his tail, <laughs> as it were. And there's an episode that was captured on a, during a soccer match. Uh, of course, this is in Europe where soccer's big. Uh, nobody would have noticed in the United States, I guess. Um, and this, uh, this soccer player had an implanted defibrillator, and he, you could see him collapsed in the top corner there, and then you can see him sitting up at the bottom after his defibrillator went off. When we think about devices, uh, implantable defibrillators, there's different kinds, and uh, we have to think with our patients what type of device might be applicable. And like pacemakers, there's single and dual chamber devices. The single chamber device uh, paces and defibrillates the ventricle. The dual chamber device also has pacing for the atrium, so it could function in the dual chamber mode. And then over on the right side is a three-lead system, uh, a CRT system, and that's an abbreviation for cardiac resynchronization therapy. So the third lead in that case is implanted via the coronary sinus and then with a branch over the left ventricle, one of the coronary veins, so that one can pace both the right and the left ventricle simultaneously and improve congestive heart failure. So your patient might be a candidate for that. Let's get into a little bit of the data here. We know that in patients who, like yours, have, uh, have a low EF, a prior MI, and are on appropriate medical therapy, we have some preliminary trials that showed that implantable defibrillators are beneficial, the MATED and the MUST study. In both of these, the patients had to have inducible VT at an EP study, and that kind of limited the applicability of it to, uh, to a widespread uh, patient population. So the MATED 2 study was designed to uh, kind of get around that issue. Um, there was no requirement for doing an EP study. The patient had to have a low EF, 30% or less, a prior MI, and then they were randomized to an ICD or to uh, um, the best medical therapy, beta blockers, etc. This is, in fact, one of our patients who was doing pretty well, but one day developed a, a rapid VT, degenerated into VF, and you can see in the bottom panel his defibrillator shocked him back to normal rhythm. Um, so patients like that patient, our patient, enrolled at a um, hundred other centers, I think, generated this sort of survival curve data that found that the uh, defibrillator had a um, uh, greatly uh, improved survival compared to uh, patients just treated with the best medical regimen. Uh, mortality was reduced with that approach. And we now have data looking at this MATA2 study out to eight years of follow-up, and it's encouraging that, uh, that the survival benefit still seems to be there. And what we're seeing as we follow these patients longer is that uh, the reduction in mortality is greater and we need to think about treating not as many patients to see one saved, to see a person saved by the defibrillator. That's amazing. And I'm going to need to treat of six. I can't think of any other therapy in cardiology anyway that you can get that much bang for the buck, if you will, or shock for the buck, if you will, um, uh, than with a defibrillator. And this is for primary prevention. Is that right? That's right. Those are patients that have not had an episode of VT or VF, but we know they're at high risk of it. And that's because it's such a deadly condition, of course, and reasonably common. And, of course, the defibrillator is extremely effective at, in those patients who do have a cardiac arrest. So it is encouraging to see that number needed to treat get down there. A similar study, the scud -Hef study, was done um, uh, through the University of Washington and here at Duke University and looked at similar patients, post-MI patients, but also patients without a prior MI with a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy and really found similar results. You can see that the bottom curve is the mortality rate with the defibrillator, and that's lower than that. The mortality rate is lower than that seen for patients with placebo or treated with amiodarone. 
Now, Scott Heft also looked at uh, different classes of heart failure, and you mentioned your patient was kind of on the verge of class two or class three. Interestingly, in the, in the Scott Heft study, a greater benefit was seen with the less symptomatic patients, the class two patients. Uh, the class three, it may be that they have a higher problem with, with pump failure deaths, as you can see uh, the trend with New York Heart Class four patients in light blue at the bottom, pump failure is really their problem. Class twos, on the other hand, sudden death is the biggest risk. Um, they may have a lower total mortality than the more advanced heart failure patients, but sudden death is the biggest part of it, and that's where, of course, the defibrillator could help. So this really underscores the original hypothesis that, uh, that these studies were aiming at, which is the risk of death in this patient population is from arrhythmias. This treatment addresses the arrhythmia issue and therefore results in, in better survival. That's exactly right. Um, so if we can identify the patient at high risk of arrhythmias, and here's the important thing, at low, relatively low risk of other things, of getting hit by a bus, <laughs> of having a heart failure, of getting cancer, then we could really target and see the greatest benefit of the devices. Some of that's, of course, hard to do. Sure. Um, let's see. So, so speaking of heart failure, um, we saw that in, in scud heft, the benefit may be a little less as the heart failure s uh, stage progresses, the heart failure symptoms progress, less benefit from the defibrillator. One approach to this is cardiac resynchronization. Now, the patients up to the present time that are candidates for that are those like your patient with a low EF, with class three or class four New York Heart Association symptoms of heart failure. Uh, and furthermore, they have to have a wide QRS on the sinus rhythm uh, on the baseline ECG. QRS of at least 120 milliseconds. Some studies have looked at 100, 130 milliseconds. So those patients can benefit from CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, that three lead device we talked about where you pace the right and left ventricle simultaneously. This is data from the CARE-HF study. And uh, this looked at patients receiving this biventricular pacing compared to the best medical therapy. Interestingly, in this study, they didn't even have a defibrillator, and we saw a dramatic reduction in mortality in these patients. So just the pacing reduced their risk of death from heart failure or from sudden death, interestingly. Hospitalizations as well were, were reduced, and we've seen improvements in how the patients feel with this treatment, their risk of hospitalization as we see with this trial, their echocardiograms get better on average, maybe a 5% improvement in the EF. Not every patient responds, and there's a lot of work to try to identify how to improve that response rate and, and get more patients improved and feeling better with that treatment. Talk a little bit about the, the QRS cutoff of 120 milliseconds. In terms of pathophysiology or how we should think about why that is a, a risk stratification factor and may, in fact, you know, identify patients who are likely to benefit more? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, my next slide here shows, shows uh, some electrophysiologic mapping data. So red, uh, this is the Doppler spectrum, red, yellow, green, blue, purple. And what this is looking at is the activation time in the right ventricle over here and in the left ventricle, this big dilated guy. And in a left bundle situation, that left ventricle is getting activated late. In fact, the lateral wall of the left ventricle over here is the latest spot. So simplistically, and I think reasonably accurately, what we think of with cardiac resynchronization therapy is that we're pacing that late area, that lateral wall of the left ventricle in a left bundle situation and getting it to activate a little earlier. So that rather than in a left bundle having the septum move over and then the lateral wall move over, we're getting both walls to move in more or less simultaneously. And that won't make the EF normal that in most cases, but it will increase the mechanical function of the heart. 
So that's really the issue there, why we're looking for a wide QRS. It's, uh, it's still up in the air whether a right bundle type configuration uh, will benefit, but you can see from this data it makes most sense with a left bundle. And um, so the cutoff of this 120 milliseconds, but really the wider the better in terms of the greater chance of response from, uh, from this type of treatment. Many of these patients will have uh, at least mild to moderate mitral regurgitation. Are there any data to suggest that uh, perhaps biventricular pacing may reduce the regurgitant fraction in any way by making the ventricle a little bit more efficient? There is. There is some data that shows that uh, MR can be reduced with this. In part, it may be reduction of ventricular volumes that we see with CRT therapy. So less dilatation of the ventricle, less stretch uh, of the annulus, and better coaptation of the mitral valve leaflets. But it may also be proper timing of activation of that papillary muscle, the lateral papillary, papillary muscle, that may improve the mitral regurgitation. There's still more studies underway to look at uh, which patients MR responds and which patients don't. So we have more to learn there, but it certainly can, can improve, and that's, uh, that's an added benefit. Um, we talked about how we implant that type of third lead, and this shows a coronary venogram, like a coronary angiogram, but it's of the veins of the heart. Um, and this is the coronary sinus here. We've inflated a balloon in it um, and occluded the coronary sinus and then injected contrast to identify the branches. And you can see these are a couple of the branches to the lateral or posterior wall that would be good places to think about putting this third lead for the cardiac resynchronization device. And then on an x-ray, you'll see uh, a lead in the right atrium, a lead in the right ventricle, and that third lead over here in the lateral wall that uh, you could better identify as being over the left ventricle in, in the lateral x-ray, where you'd see that it's posterior in the heart. And there we have it. There's that uh, left ventricular lead back here posteriorly and the RV lead more anteriorly here. So the defibrillator is, is certainly something to think about in, in your patient, Sunil. Um, uh, it sounds like he's at risk of sudden death. He hasn't yet had an arrhythmia. And we know from the MATE2 and the SCUDHEF studies that uh, this kind of patient may have a reduced risk of dying with the defibrillator. Uh, it may also be that he might benefit from CRT depending upon the uh, appearance of his ECG. This is really terrific data. Thank you for reviewing that. And I'm curious, I mean, the, the benefits are, just seem so clear. I mean, these are randomized trials, prospective, with hard endpoints. What's been the uptake? Or are there deficiencies or disparities in um, whether appropriate patients are getting these devices? Boy, that's a great question, and a lot of people have been scratching their heads over this because the data are not just from one study, but several, and, and really show a dramatic reduction in mortality. Not just a relative reduction, but, but real change in absolute mortality. Um, and there has been an uptake. There have been a number of patients uh, implanted with these devices as a primary prevention of sudden death for prophylactic uh, defibrillator therapy. But, but it really varies by, by community, by physician, by hospital, by physician group. We've seen differences. Um, uh, some of my colleagues, some of our colleagues here at Duke have looked at this and found differences in different racial groups, different ages, different geographic regions. Um, it may be partly education of the physicians. Um, but some of the issues relate to cost. People are worried about uh, the health care costs and, uh, and uh, their role in, uh, in increasing them. Um, it's a costly device, but there are some data that suggest that in the right patient it can be cost effective. Um, there also have been concerns on the patient's side from uh, some issues like receiving a shock when it's not a life-threatening arrhythmia, an inappropriate shock, we call it. Um, issues related to recalls. Uh, this has been in the news, and I think that's uh, been a factor that's swayed some patients to maybe not get the defibrillator that might help them. And, and the uh, issue of congestive heart failure, if, if, uh, if it's not a CRT device, uh, 
the patient still uh, may be at risk of developing worsening congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. So for our audience who are, who's watching, talk a little bit about each one of these issues. So let's talk about the cost issues. Obviously, these are expensive devices. Mm -hmm. We're entering an era, maybe we've always been in the era where we should be thinking about costs, but this is certainly going to be an issue going forward. Um, Tell us a little bit about the data for, for the cost effectiveness of these devices and, and what the trials tell us. Yeah, well, the trials are, are, have a limited um, uh, ability to inform us about this. And, this. and the reason is that the trials only run two, three, maybe five years at the most. The devices, uh, we hope, last longer. We, the, the current ones are lasting six, seven, maybe eight years. And... Um, to see the full benefit of the device, as we saw with that eight-year follow-up data in Meta 2, two or three years really doesn't tell us enough. So if we just look at the cost effectiveness in the short period of the trial, we'll see a high number. It'll seem very costly to implement this therapy. But we have to think about the lifetime of the patient, or at least the lifetime of, batter, of the battery of the defibrillator as a starting point. When we look at uh, the time frame of maybe 8, 10, 12 years, as some studies have looked at, the cost effectiveness uh, comes down to reasonable terms, $50,000 per life year saved, maybe less. All of these cost e effectiveness studies depend on a lot of assumptions, of and, uh, and uh, it's hard to get a, a really firm number on this. Mm -hmm. And certainly $50,000 is sort of what we as a, as a profession have accepted as being cost effective. Now, I remember when, when the MADIT 2 uh, study came out and we examined our, our, our own clinical uh, clinic population at, at Duke, and we got a little bit scared because we identified, uh, you know, hundreds of patients who would potentially be candidates for this. Tell me a little bit about the future uh, of the field of EP. I mean, are there, is, do you foresee, for example, these primary prevention devices being put in uh, by maybe heart failure physicians rather than uh, uh, people who've trained in EP uh, who may be perhaps doing more specialized procedures like ablations and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's been a big topic of conversation. Um, you know, one idea is that there haven't been enough EP physicians around to implant these devices. Um, that, that point's been argued and I don't, um, I don't know that there's a definite answer on that, but uh, um, there have been some program, training programs that have looked at a combined heart failure and device implantation uh, training, and that makes a lot of sense because these are the patients at risk of, uh, of uh, sudden death, and uh, they're being seen by the same doctor. He, can, he or she can identify them and, and then uh, take care of them for, for all the way through implanting their device and then afterwards, so that can make sense. We don't have a ton of heart failure physicians, specially trained heart failure physicians, though, either. There is some data that's a bit of a caution in that we've learned from the ICD registry that, that the um, success or at least the complication rates may be different by physician training. Um, so that should, um, that should obviously be important, too. We don't just want to maximize the number of the devices getting put in. We want to take patient safety uh, as a very top uh, priority. Mm -hmm. So that's a concern with uh, implantation of the devices by perhaps less well-trained or less um, physicians with less training, less years of specialization in just this procedure. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the patient safety issue. What, when you have a conversation with a patient that uh, is about to get one of these devices, what are the things that you tell them? What are the risks of having the procedure what are the things that they need to watch out for um, once they leave the hospital? And this is a permanently implanted device, uh, presumably. So uh, what are the things that they need to watch out for? Great question. So I think when we, when we see the patient, we not only have to give them the good news that the device may save their life, and we have to be realistic there. We can't tell the patient they're going to die tomorrow if they don't get the defibrillator because we don't know that. Some of these patients at high risk, like your patient, may never have an arrhythmia. He may get the device implanted, and, and it may never fire. So I think that's one thing to tell the patient. But, uh, but on the downside, I think we have to be aware of some complications that can occur. So acutely, there's some complications, um, and these can be broken down into those related to the lead. Uh, the lead could perforate, 
um, risk of that's under 1%, but it could cause a pericardial effusion that needs to be addressed very rapidly in some cases. The lead could dislodge, again, about a 1%, maybe 2% risk. A higher risk in, with that third lead that's placed through that coronary vein, uh, through the coronary sinus, a little higher risk of dislodgement with that lead, maybe 5%. There are issues related to the pocket. There could be bleeding, a hematoma. There could be infection. Um, and then there are issues, uh, complications that could arise related to testing of the device. When we test the device, we actually put the patient into ventricular fibrillation, confirm that the device can shock them out of it back to normal rhythm. And very, very rarely it may be unsuccessful at, at doing that. This is sort of a one in a thousand risk but the patient could have hemodynamic consequences of being in VF for even a certain number of seconds. So, um, so that's a concern. We have to be ready to treat those things. Down the road, after the patient leaves the hospital, there are things that could be uh, uh, adverse events. Inappropriate shocks we mentioned a little bit. This could occur due to atrial fibrillation. Uh, so programming of the device is important to take into account. We're doing a randomized study now looking at different programming uh, settings. Can we reduce the rate of inappropriate shocks yet still maintain the benefit of saving life-saving uh, shock therapy for real arrhythmias? Leads are really, we're asking them to do a lot, to pace, to sense, to deliver shocks. The heart's contracting every second. The leads are getting flexed and moved. The shoulder's moving. The leads can fail. Um, certain designs of leads may have a higher failure rate. Um, the longer they're in, the higher the failure rate may be. So we have to be observant and watch out for that. Early on, this is uh, less than a 1% a year thing, but it, with time, the rate may increase. Infections could occur down the road if the patient develops bacteremia. Heart failure, we mentioned briefly. So in the MATE2 study, we saw that there the patients in the ICD arm had less chance of dying, but they had a little bit higher hospitalization rate for heart failure, and we found that very interesting and uh, you know, pursued further studies to look at that. We also mentioned recalls as something that the patient should be informed of before they get the device that, that this could come up in the future. So that's great, and, and what strikes me is that for primary prevention, you know, what we're doing is really treating the patient's eventuality or potential for having an arrhythmia. Tell me a little bit, and this is a little bit advanced uh, of a topic perhaps, but for patients who do get repeated shocks, appropriate shocks, what are some strategies that can be employed? And talk a little bit about both drug therapy and, and which candidates are candidates maybe for uh, ablative therapies. Terrific, yeah. So um, these repeated shocks um, are a concern. A, the patient um, feels uncomfortable receiving the shock. They may feel uh, fainting episodes that occurred before the device can get them out of VT or VF. But um, we've also seen that these patients who are rescued by their defibrillator from a life-threatening arrhythmia event are ones at real high risk of developing heart failure and of dying in follow-up one, two years even uh, down the road or less. So um, this is a patient population we really have to turn our attention to, and um, there are different strategies that have been used. We know that if antiarrhythmic drugs are administered uh, uh, to all of these ICD patients, we can reduce the risk of shocks with medicines like amiodarone. Unfortunately, there are a lot of complications in the toxicity of amiodarone, and that approach hasn't really caught on. But after the patient is shocked, amiodarone or sotalol are commonly used. And uh, I think those are the first line treatments. But there are some data now that using catheter ablation of VT may be even a better strategy than using antiarrhythmic drugs. A new study just came out from Germany. A study was done uh, from Boston several years ago. The SMASH VT study looked at uh, kind of preemptively doing a catheter ablation at the time of ICD implantation. And um, we can see that with this approach, the, the sh number of shocks the patient is likely to receive can be reduced. Uh, certainly after the patient has had one or more shocks, and especially after they've failed amiodarone, 
uh, ablation is definitely an option. The patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy seem to be better, really best candidates for catheter ablation of VT because we can usually find scar on the endocardium, on the inside of the heart, to map out and ablate to target the VT and to uh, also try to ablate uh, around the scars to prevent future VTs from happening. So catheter ablation is important to think about uh, early on in the patient after they've had a shock for VT. Now, just in the last few minutes here, I, you know, I want to get back to sort of the epidemiological uh, issues here. And it strikes me that certainly the patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy are at high risk for, for sudden cardiac death. But a large proportion of patients who have sudden cardiac death have no history of heart disease. So tell me a little bit about the trials that are ongoing now. Are we pushing the envelope? Are we, are we trying to expand the pool of patients who may be candidates for, for this type of therapy? Well, you're right. Even we, we talked about how ICDs are not being implanted for all of the patients who are candidates, like the MATA2 or SCUDHEF patient or your patient we talked about. Uh, but even if they were implanted in all of those patients, we wouldn't eradicate uh, sudden death like polio has been eradicated. Uh, because there are a lot of patients who are at lower risk of sudden death on an individual patient basis, but there's so many of them. So we're talking about the patient who's had an MI but doesn't have that bad of an EF, maybe it's 45, or the patient with diabetes who's at high risk of having that first ischemic event that might, be a, might lead to a fatal arrhythmia. So this is the kind of patient population that, that future ICD trials are looking at. One trial is looking at uh, MRIs in these patients, and um, patients with an EF above 35 who are not candidates right now for an ICD, but if they have a substantial size of scar in the heart, we have know from previous studies that that puts them at high risk of a VT event down the road, and studies are being done to look at uh, would an ICD implanted in that patient possibly be life-saving. So lots to look forward to. Indeed, we have a lot more to learn. We've, we've made great progress, but, uh, but there's a lot more to learn about, about both sudden death and about improving heart failure with these devices. Terrific. Well, Jim, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Uh, my guest faculty today has been Dr. James Aubert, one of my colleagues here at Duke. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and thanks for the discussion. Until next time, then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Sunil Rao saying thanks for joining us, and take care.